We are live. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Rake Straw Book Design Live Events, and we are all happy to be here. I'm your host, John Rake Straw, and, you know, we talk about the craft of writing, which is one of those marvelous sense of uh, putting the words together, making this all happen. It is an amazing process. So I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to actually be here. And uh, I will turn that off just a little bit. Uh, Tony, just unmute yourself when it's time for you to talk. Uh, there was an echo there that was a little annoying. So we'll bring her in in just a moment. We're going to talk about editing. Editing. My favorite subject. And uh, one of the things about editing is getting your book ready for the public. That's what it basically is. It's taking that marvelous writing you've done, those word pictures, throwing them onto the table for somebody else to look at. So it's a it's an interesting process. So I have with me a professional editor by the name of Tony Rakestraw. She has the same last name as me because she's my wife. <laughs> but we're gonna talk editing. So Tony what brought you into this crazy world of editing? You know, it's bad enough to have to, you know, work with writers, but to edit their work, what is that like? Well, um, I've always been the person to correct everybody else. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, even went back in high school when we get handouts from the English teachers, I'd correct them and hand them back to the teachers. So with, it's just with red marks. I remember. I remember. <laughs> I was there. It's, I remember it. It's just part of who I am. <laughs> well, when you actually graduated from high school, you actually gave a teacher a book. Huh? I I did. I did. When I graduated from high school, I gave my creative writing teacher a spelling dictionary, so that he could get on without me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember the what some of the funnest stuff was driving around. We we once had to do. She got the job as a singing telegram person. We would go in and she'd have to dress up in these different characters. And we'd drive all over the place. And we'd drive by signs that were written wrong. And you'd hear her going, I can't believe they did that. <laughs> she I still, still does do. it to this day. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Always the editor. So when you looked at doing this, what was the start of it? What made you finally decide that, hey, I'm going to make this a living? Well, I was ghostwriting website articles, and um, they don't pay you very much for that, and it takes forever to do them, especially when they want all the right keywords in the right places, and they have to be repeated so many times, and it's just, it's kind of soul-sucking. Anyway, um, I had decided that I was going to start doing some editing because I'd done some for other people on what their websites and I had done some editing for um, a, this midwifery school that I'd been attending. I did their conference magazine and some other things for them. And um, so I put a thing out uh, saying that I would do um, some book editing for people and I charged very little for it at the time. Um, and I took a few courses to make sure that my skills were where they needed to be. Um, I got my Chicago manual style and studied it and um, then I started hanging out my shingle officially. And then eventually the clients started coming in. So what do you think is the biggest issue for editors? Not for writers, but for editors. Mm. Consistency, I think. Um, a lot of people think that just because they write, they can edit. And since there isn't like a, a college degree in editing, um, they aren't taught how to do it. I really encourage anybody who <coughs> excuse me, wants to edit to 
find some courses in it. Uh, they have some through the graduate school, through the Department of Agriculture. They have some through the Editorial Freelance Association. There's lots of places that you can take courses to get your editing skills up to par so that you have a consistent skill level. Not just you, you don't just go and correct spelling. There's more to it than that. Um, the Chicago Manual style is what we use here in the states for publications, um, and it covers a lot more than spelling and grammar. And you need to know how to use it. It's it's really thick. This is it. It's you know it's here. The camera's there. It's really thick. You have to know all all this stuff. And um, it's it, you. You just have to know it. You, you can't just say, "Okay, well, I spell checked it, and now it's edited." There's just a lot more to it. Yeah, I agree. That's the uh, so when you look at this idea of an editor, how many different types of editors are there? Because people think of just somebody. You know, looking at their spelling and making sure that they have commas where they need to be and things like that. <coughs> what other type of editors are there? Okay, well, what, there's. Go ahead. There's proofreading. That's the last thing that you do just to make sure that there's no errors. There's copy editing. There's line editing. There's developmental editing. Uh, there's so many different levels of editing. Developmental is someone who helps you from the get-go. You've got a story idea, they help you develop it. They help you make sure that there's no plot holes, that you're following your story arcs, your characters are well developed. Then uh, line editing goes through the story line by line, make sure that you've got the right word choice, that there's good readability, that um, everything is flowing the way it should, your paragraphs are good, each scene has its own little story arc, each chapter has its own little story arc, each character has its own arc. Uh, then there's copy editing, which is all the little bits and pieces, the grammatical, the the spelling, the every little punctuation mark is in the right spot. And then at the very, very end, when everything else has been done, and formatting has been done, and everything. Then it goes to the proofreader to make sure that nothing got shifted. There's just so many steps. On our website, I have a thing that I, I borrowed from a book on book design, and it's write, rewrite, edit, rewrite, edit, rewrite, edit, edit, <laughs> over and over and over and over. And finally, you get to publication. <laughs> That's what it is. You don't just write and then publish. So, is there a tendency to skip this step in writing that they want to go from I just wrote a wonderful story, now I want to publish it, and they forget this <laughs> huge, vast valley in between that they don't want to, that they, yeah, first of all, some can't afford it, we hear. Some just think, hey, I don't need that. I had my aunt, who's an English teacher, go over it, and it's ready to go. So is there a tendency to want to skip this very important step? Matter of fact, probably the most important, to get your book ready. But people seem to want to skip this. Why is that? Definitely, uh, especially, and I don't want to hit up indie writers, because I'm an indie writer. <laughs> uh, some of my best friends are indie writers. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who say, hey, I don't need to edit because I, I read it through. It's fine. My friend read it through. Um, my grandma read it through. We didn't find any errors. And then you look through their reviews on Amazon, and they've got all these one-star reviews say, they're so full of editorial issues. Didn't they have an editor? Gee, no, they didn't. Um, and English teachers are great. You know, I loved English. It was my favorite, favorite class ever. And I loved my English teachers, but they're not editors. They don't teach you how to edit in college when you have an English major. Um, 
So while they may catch some, they don't catch everything. Um, same if if your mother's a librarian or whatever, they, or they major in literature. They know how to find the theme. They know how to tear the book apart and find all these little uh, storylines and everything, but they don't know how to edit. Um, editing is what polishes your story or your nonfiction book. It makes sure that your message is clear. Uh, is it expensive? It can be. It depends on how long your book is. Um, people will charge by the word or by the thousand. Like some people charge so much per thousand words. Um, some people charge by the page. Um, but it's an investment. Your book represents you. This is your product that you want people to pay for. So if you want the best that you can put out there and pe expect people to fork over their money for, then you've got to invest in it. Um, if you were going to sell vegetables, you would want to put the best vegetables forward. You wouldn't want to put ones that were half rotten out there. Um, if you were going to go out for a job interview, you wouldn't want to go out with dirt on your face and torn clothing. You would want to look your best. So the same is with your book. You want to put the best book out there that you can. And I've had some pretty lively discussions online with people who don't think that the editing step is necessary. <laughs> um, and even the big publishers are cutting back on their editorial staff and you can tell the difference when you read a book and you're reading it through and there are errors in it. Um, I was reading and not five just cousins. errors. And not just errors, there is actual now um, story arc issues with these major writers. You start seeing that, you know, I start reading some of this stuff and I've seen with James Patterson and a few other that I go, wow, this is not the same work I was getting 15 years ago from these people. Yeah. Uh, I was reading a Clive Cussler book a few months ago and there was the wrong version of a word here and there. There was misspelled words. You know, it, these are these are errors that should have been caught. You know, they're obvious. Yeah, so when we when we are talking about this, what also about the fact that um, writers tend to think that um, you're going to basically change their story. You're they're handing it to somebody and they're going to tell you that this is not the story, this is what you should be writing. How do we make them feel that an editor is not someone who's going to uh, slap you around and make you write their story, that they still are working within your genre, with, with your words? So I, I get a sense from some people online, worry about that. I don't want to give my story off to this person. They might tell me that I need to write something different. How do you well, handle that as an editor? Well, again, that depends on what kind of editing you're looking for. Um, if you're going to a developmental editor, well, that's their job. <laughs> um, they're going to point out all your weak points and they're going to tell you how to make it better. Um, if you're just going to a line editor, well, they're going to tell you, okay, this phrase would be better if you did it this way. Um, this word choice isn't the best. If you're trying to say this, you might want to phrase it this way. Um, if you're just getting a copy edit, they're just, they shouldn't be changing a whole lot except polishing. Um, so a lot will depend on what type of edit you're going for. If um, you don't know what type of edit you need, <laughs> well then part of that lays on you. Um, Really, you shouldn't even send your book to an editor until you have done as many revisions as you can possibly do and you think that you've gotten it to the best level that you can get it. Otherwise, um, you're not getting the most you can for your editing dollar. If you're sending your first draft to an editor, 
you're not only wasting your money, <laughs> you're wasting the editor's time because, um, you know, a rough draft is not what we do our best work on because there's too much to do. Um, our job is to polish, not to rewrite. And if you want us to rewrite it, well, that's a whole other avenue. And if you want us to ghostwrite it, the money goes up. <laughs> so um, that's, that's something else to talk about. <laughs> yeah, so we're saying then that a writer should actually learn the craft enough to be able to get it polished enough that when they send it to you that it's you're doing the final finishing work and helping them get their story or their you know, their how-to book ready to finally go before the public. Yeah, unless you're working with a developmental editor, yes, definitely. Uh, I've had some books cross my desk. Um, it, it looks like they just scrawled the first words that came across their their mind and sent it to me. Um, incomplete sentences, misspelled words that were, you know, like they didn't even correct the, you know, that's that's a waste of my time, it's a waste of their time, you know, you could have fixed that with a spell check. Um, so, yes, please revise. So where in the process do you come into the game uh, for a writer when you think about it? Where is your best moment to suddenly be, to come in? I mean, there is the developmental, and there is those people who say, hey, I've gotten it this far, I need help. We understand that. That's a whole different animal. But let's say you got somebody who's written their story, they've done a lot of rewrites, they've been working on it for a couple of years. Uh, when is it that they should finally see an editor? Is there a, a, a moment or is it just that time when that writer says, okay, I'm ready to hand it over? The writer should know. Um, if, if they feel that they can't take it any further, then it's time it, they can send it to beta readers. Beta readers are a great place to get feedback. Um, they'll read it. They'll give their feedback on what they feel is working, what's not working. If the writer f feels that the story is complete and they can't do anything more with it, then yeah, it's time to just give it to the editor and see what what else can be done or to polish it. That's that's the best time. Now, what's interesting is. You can't, I, my favorite one is you get somebody who wants you to, you know, they say, I have uh, 83,000 words, how much is that going to cost? And my favorite thing about that is that without seeing the actual writing, a lot of times you can't quote for them because you don't know what type of style of editing they need. So how do you get around, how do you work with that? I mean, because that's going to be, you know, somebody might get a hold of you and think, all I need is a simple line edit, and you find out later that they actually need developmental editing because they have some major plot issues, they don't understand story arc completely. So how do you help people to, you know, how do you decide how much to charge? Well, if they decide that that's really what they want is a line edit, I will charge them for a line edit, and that's what I'll do. If they have bigger issues, I'll bring that up to them and talk to them about it. But if they don't want to address that, that's their choice. Um, it's their book. Um, I won't address them if they don't want to. That's a good answer. Uh, but yeah, I, Harlan, what do you have to ask? I was wondering if there's a, a common a common problem that you see in everything you do and every all the editing you do is there something that occurs more frequently than anything else hmm things kind of go in trends <laughs> um, Sometimes it seems I get a lot of uh, 
similar issues. Um, lately, it's all really simple things like they'll capitalize he said, she said, which you know is very basic. Um, other times, I gotta think back now. You're making me think. <laughs> Um, so you're editing your response as we speak? <laughs> no, I just have to think. I, I, I work on several books at one time. Ah, that's going to be good. And difficult. so, yeah, um, I'm looking at my board and seeing if anything pops out at me. Surprisingly, what I've seen from her complaining, well, not really complaining, <laughs> More I don't complain. I just, she I never just have to. I just have to get things out of my system sometimes. There's a lot of trouble with tense, getting the tense right. Uh, also, yeah. how to handle. Uh, we have people who are going from first person to suddenly third person, and sometimes in the same paragraph. You know, there's the issue of uh, the big issue is they want to give a ending to the book. That is sort of like a uh, a non-ending, and they want to keep us in suspense for another book. But oh. it's not even it's not even set up to be like a cliffhanger, <laughs> and they think that's what I've they've done. I've had a few like that. I've had a few yeah. like that over the past couple years. Um, there's there is a lot of story structure not being not happening. Um, people are you know because they can write, they're throwing out. A story, but they're not thinking or understanding the concept of how you develop a story, how it's done, whether it's a three act, a four act, or how you're going to do your character development. I've seen a lot of that too. How do you handle that, Tony? I mean, as an editor, and all they ever, if they hire, if they hire you just to do a line edit, is it all you do is a line edit, or do you try to? Um, give them some help in that area when you see it glaring. I'll bring it up, and if they're interested in addressing it, we can talk about it. Um, if they're not, I'll continue with my line edit. I do. If they're new to writing, I will suggest several resources that I keep on hand, um, and some of them follow up with that, and some of them don't. Um, I have several books that I fall back on, uh, several on writing scenes, some on um, story arcs and how to build a story um, that I really like. So it's up to them if they want to learn or not. Do you find a lot of resistance to your advice or to your your Not generally. Generally, uh, the authors I get are, are pretty open. I mean, it's up to them if they want to take my advice or not. They're the ones paying me, so <laughs> if they want to pay it and not take my advice, well. <laughs> Did well, you happen I'm... to see that post? I'm sorry, Jim. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm bogarting the. the... No, I don't. This is. We've got plenty of time today. This is a relaxed conversation. It's not supposed <laughs> to be a. Your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn. No, it's not supposed to be that way. But I do have a question about. Since I'm an outsider to the, you know, I'd be like a brand new writer. I'd be saying, I got a story to tell. Let me do this. And I kind of think I know what chapters are supposed to be. And then you mentioned something that right now is a little bit foreign to me, and that is the story arc. And let's just say the arc of a character within a chapter, because that seems to be the way you define chapters is something happens and then you move on to another segment of the story. And could you tell me a little bit more about what you see in the way of a bad character arc within a chapter and how you would fix it? Yeah, okay. So the, the story arc is from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. Now, if you take the Harry Potter series, for example, there was one major story arc for the whole seven books. Then each book had their own story. Then each chapter had their own little things happening. Like for the first chapter in book one, we meet Harry and his aunt and uncle and and find out what his life is like in, in their household. 
and that it's not very good. Um, then the character arc is then how Harry grows from that beginning scene to the end of that book. And then he also has his overarching arc as he grows from the whole book series. Then each right. scene within each chapter also has a small little arc because each scene has a goal. We want to learn something from each scene that furthers the story. And then there's scenes that also connect the conflict scenes, but we're still learning things from those scenes. It gets complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> um, well, but yeah, because you could revise what conflict you really want to develop because you say right. this, I thought it was going to, this, it was going to be really a, a interesting conflict, but I get part way through and it's like, well, now what do I do with it because it's not all that interesting after all. Do I have to rewrite the chapters or what? Well, it, it depends on Sometimes it just needs a little tweak to make it more interesting, and sometimes, yeah, you need to rewrite it. It all depends on what the underlying issue is, of why it wasn't interesting. I would say the story arc, as well as the character arc, is uh, fundamentally dependent on what the character wants and what gets in his way, on his way to achieving it. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yes. It, we, you have to have conflict, and that all depends on what obstacles lie in his path. And that's when the, the great development of the villain comes into play. Yes. The antagonist, yes. whatever it happens to be. Yes. Uh, all of us authors are, are, we get to indulge in all of our mean streaks when we write because we get to throw all these nasty things in the way. <laughs> Now, is it true most every nasty thing results from, like, women, or is it non-gender specific? It's non-gender specific. It can be anything. Okay. As we were at the fair this week at a book signing with the Oregon Authors Table, and there was one author who wrote murder mysteries, and she said, I just love my work. I get to kill people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was so fun. <laughs> I said, Did so you have to see the uh, post that the 11-year-old uh, girl put up on on Google? No. Asking for no. advice on what you might do or what anyone might give to, to help her help her story along. She said it wasn't finished. She was new to, to Google. Take a look at Take a look at her post. Try to find it. I can't recall her name. But the first paragraph, <laughs> it made me laugh out loud because of her use of adjectives to describe absolutely everything. I mean, really, she could have cut that paragraph down by 75% and she would have omitted the adjectives she was using. It, it was really amazing. And she's 11, you know. That she's got this terrific story started, but she's she's making all the usual mistakes in the beginning. There was another guy who was asking for an adverb that he could use to describe how a line was spoken, and he he, he couldn't think of anything, so he was asking Google Plusers for advice on that, and I explained to him that. You don't have to describe how a sentence is spoken in dialogue. The, the, uh, the posture of the character speaking or the previous buildup of this character will give you all you need to know about how he speaks his lines, whether he's a, a, an aggravating person or a very pleasant person. It will be interesting to see what he does with that. With that don't use adverbs to describe your dialogue. It simply isn't necessary. That's right. You don't need them. Very, very seldom. Then you can eliminate a lot of the he said, she said as well. Yes, it's yeah, every line gets its own, every line of dialogue gets its own line. But you don't have to use he said or she said in every one of them because no. the, the, the lines that follow make it obvious 
who's speaking unless there's a third or more party involved. Then you can use something like the third party, uh, Jane shrugged, and then yep. see what she says. Nice physical beat does that for you. Yes, she interjects into the, into the conversation. Then you know it's her by what the author tells you she does while she speaks, before she speaks. Not saying she said grudgingly. <laughs> so it's hard for young writers, new writers, to get used to that sort of thing. I don't know where they get it. I don't know either. I get authors who will tell you who's speaking every time they speak, even if it's in the same paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. And what's confusing in dialogue is I've read in, in uh, profoundly published authors uh, a line of dialogue at the end of an entire paragraph, or even one in the middle. And that's difficult to explain to a new writer how you can do that. There shouldn't be a paragraph following the, the line of dialogue. But there are instances in which a paragraph of narration will precede a line of dialogue. And I have my doubts about that. Dialogue should stay within the paragraph or get its own line. Because I've seen it used both ways. What? It doesn't have to have its own line if the, the paragraph can act as the physical beat. So, if it's related to the the line, then the the dialogue can fit in there, and it can be confusing if you have a paragraph of what that character's doing, and then the character speaks. It's dropped down a line, then the reader can think, "Oh, the other person's speaking," but then the other person speaks, and then, "Oh, so that line was the first person." And then you have to go back and reread it, and that pulls you out of the story because you have to go back and and rethink it because oh that was that first person, and I I get that all the time. And yeah, you don't want the reader to have to go back and check. You want no. The to go smooth and. That's and, right. And you don't want to pull them out of the story to double check. Yeah, and to be pertinent to the scene as well. I don't think a lot of uh, writers understand that. Dialogue is always part of the scene. It's impossible yes. for it to be anything else. And they don't include where the dialogue is taking place. No, you should include as many sensory things and setting things as part of the scene as possible. It shouldn't be separate at the beginning and at the end. It should be part of the whole scene. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And interruptions are nice, too. <laughs> a lawnmower going by outside. Or yes. Walks up. Will you have anything else? And she tops off the coffee. Breaks up the dialogue. And no yes. one can break up the dialogue is extremely important because it might give the previous speaker an opportunity to think before it makes a comment on the previous speaker's remark. Exactly. I have a question. I have yeah. a question about what you're talking about because. When do you choose to narrate versus having the person, one or both of them, who are speaking the dialogue, fill in the same information? You know, where like in, it, I guess it gets back to like some TV shows, where instead of having time to develop the show, they just have somebody talk about what just happened. You go, okay, now they're just, they're telling us. It's like the villain has to now fill in all the blanks because the show or that the story didn't fill them in, so now all the explanation comes from a reveal, let's say, or you know, just use the device if somebody just says, "Oh, well, I did this because." Okay, well, it depends on your story style, partly. Um, in a story, you want to show as much as you can versus telling. You want to, and that's basically what that would be is, is telling something rather than showing it in dialogue and setting the scene. Um, you want to reserve your telling for when you're summarizing something. If you have a, a complicated plot, sometimes you need to come back in and, and kind of summarize the events that happened up so 
and kind of remind your reader what has happened. Um, or say a lot's been going on, but it's kind of the same kind of stuff. Like they're on a vacation and they had this wonderful, wonderful day, and oh, and the rest of the week was, you know, kind of the same thing. So you kind of gloss it over. That's something you can tell rather than go through each and every day the exact same way. Um, so you want to pick out the highlights of your character's experience that are pertinent to the story. Like going back to Harry Potter, because I love Harry Potter. Um, <clears throat> you don't want to go through every single day of his year at Hogwarts. You want to pick out the highlights to describe and go in depth about and relive with Harry. You don't want to have to describe every single day in potions class and every single day at lunch and every single day, you know, because that gets monotonous and boring. So those can be glossed over, and that's where the telling comes in. Sometimes apparently irrelevant comments by one of the well, the people in the scene say there's two people. Uh, we make the dialogue clearer. As an example, uh, a, a girl's mother says, "Don't, don't look in the in the refrigerator, dear." Or don't look, don't stand there looking at the refrigerator, dear. Now you know they're in the kitchen. And uh, she says, I'm not looking at the refrigerator, Mom. I'm into the refrigerator. Well, she says, Mother. There's a separation between the, emotionally between the girl and her mother. And she says, you'll ruin your dinner. And she says, it's your cooking that ruins the dinner, Mother. That's why I'm looking into the refrigerator. Now, you, <laughs> you can see the contrast in the, or, or not a contrast. The abrasive relationship she has with her mother. You know they're in the kitchen. And you know the, the, the daughter is taking the mother literally just so she can be abrasive, take control. So you'll ruin your dinner. It's a good reason not to look into the refrigerator. But she doesn't argue about whether you're looking into the refrigerator or looking at the refrigerator. And the, the turmoil rolls along with it. That sort of thing. Sometimes irrelevant remarks or uh, questions that aren't even answered, left rhetorical, really help the character uh, description along, as well as the development of the scene, wouldn't you think? Definitely. Um, that's a really good example because if you can get all that through in the dialogue and um, all that feeling and all that tension just in the word choice, that's ideal. The reader picks up on that, and you don't have to spend pages describing it. Um, that's that's what the goal is. You don't have to mention what anybody's wearing. No. Or even what time of day it is or anything else. No, it's all there. And you're getting a description of the characters. The mother is weak, the daughter is strong. There's a little contempt between the two of them. And it's it's subtle. It, it goes into the mind immediately, and you can count on that throughout the rest of the story. Even though you discover that the girl does have some sympathy for her mother. She she wants to leave, but she can't leave her mother alone. Mm -hmm. sort of thing now, uh, would you say that, just along that line, that, you know, that one example you brought out there, it just is the the art of sarcasm something you really should study as an author to develop this conflict or this this tone of a scene you say okay that expression was sarcastic and the reader should pick up on that because that is what I want them to do but if it's too subtle the readers may not even understand that you're setting up this conflict the use of the word mother that sparks the sarcasm right then and there sets up the separation between the parent and, and the child. So, yes, if there's an art to sarcasm, I think it should be studied. It's as important as knowing what humor is 
humor is extremely important, and it's not easy to pull off all the time. Sarcasm is a good way to do it. Or ignorance, dumb as a box of rocks, ignorance will bring out humor in a character really well. Unless there's an intellectual kind of humor, then it's so subtle and nuanced that the reader might even miss it. Well, you got into the word intelligence and nuance, and John just went quiet. <laughs> Uh, you know that's how it is. You know, <laughs> you get into those, you get into those fancy phrases, those ten dollar words, and you know you throw me off. I mean, I think that the, one of the things that uh, in the development of a story is the subtext and how to bring that into your writing uh, and how to as a, how, you know, how do you teach? new writers that concept of subtext of that inner dialogue that's up here at the same time that they're talking to their mother or something there's other dialogue going on you don't really write it but there's got you know the sarcasm the idea how do you embrace that and bring that forward in your writing because it is a sophisticated sort of process and it takes a writer from being a newbie to being somebody who now is able to impart their story in such a magnificent way. And how do you teach that? Or how do you help a writer find that, even as an editor? I'd say there were, <laughs> say there were two ways to do it. And the most common way, which I think is typical of new writers, is to go into an inner dialogue of one of the characters. And the other way, as you said, is to bring in, uh, or as we said, it's a way to bring in sarcasm or humor or a dark inner tension sort of thing. Those are, the, I think, the only two ways there are. The uh, inner dialogue, I think, is most commonly used. I see that in some of the samples put up on Google+. Plus. I read a lot of the amateur writing on Google+. Plus. It's no wonder that people need editors. It really is. What would you say, Tony? Yeah, um, there, using an inner dialogue is great. Um, uh, a lot of that can come across just um, in the tone of the scene. It, it's not that difficult to get someone to understand how to do that. Um, you don't have to say, they said sarcastically, even though a lot of writers say that. Um, <laughs> a lot of it should just come across in just the tone in the scene, and it does. If, if they've got it set up correctly, it does, and, and you don't need that. Um, they think they, they do. They think they need the adverb, but the tone is already there. Yeah. Writers have a tendency, the new ones, to underestimate their reader. And yeah. they, that's what causes them to jump through all the, hu the hoops with description and adverbs at the ends of dialogue, and things like that. And you shouldn't do that. The beginning writers are like beginning, beginning criminals. They don't think anyone is as smart as they are. And they make all the same mistakes that the police and the reader see right off the bat. The, the sophistication of the reader is not to be underestimated. Well, I have a question on that because, okay, let's say you're trying to learn to write and you think you can tell as good a story as you've seen on all these drama shows, any kind of a genre you want to pick, and so you've watched these. Now, drama shows on television or, you know, plays or movies, they're the ones that now have to use dialogue all the time, even though they're setting the scene because of visuals. Well, now someone's learning, going, boy, I love those stories. I'm going to write something just like that because I'm inspired. Now, does watching a television series that you really like 
help you learn to write better, or is it something you have to step back from going, okay, I have to forget how the story was done for a television or a movie program, and I have to change and really do things differently. No, there's one word that describes competently what you learn about writing on television. And that word is unfortunate. You can't do in a book what they do on the screen in television or in a movie. You can't learn anything about love or crime or police procedure or, well, maybe history to some degree. Bad characters, good characters. You see that going on, but picking up how to produce that is a bit of a trick. It's better to learn to write from reading. Not from watching what is unfortunate on television or in the movies. It's not a good context for learning to write. And I will hold that to my dying day. <laughs> Which may not be very long for no, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see where you're coming from, Harlan, but I think there is a um, a chance to take a look at dialogue. Uh, if you don't get to go out and watch dialogue much and you don't get to see how people are behaving, it is a good area to watch for dialogue because then you see the anticipation that the other person has wanting to get their point of view put in. Um, good dialogue, written good you know, writing of good dialogue shows that where the person is waiting or they want to get in before that other person and that they're having to wait their turn for that person to take a breath. Um, good dialogue is, uh, is, is a marvelous process in writing. Now, dialogue is one of the hardest parts. I think it's one of the parts that people have the hardest thing with. With dialogue, how do we make sure that it's moving along and it doesn't? I, I I've seen good writing where it just you know who's talking by how they're what they're saying. Do we have to teach writers the fact of dividing up their characters so that the characters don't all sound the same? And how do we do that? How do we? divide up that idea. And as an editor, can do you have to tell people, you know, you need to give each character their own pace and their own nuances. How would you, you know, do that for a writer? Because it is, it's just the same words, it's the same stuff on the page, but how do we make it so that there's the character that you know which character is talking? Yeah, that's that's even more important when they're writing in multiple first person. Um, though back to just for a second, I want to go back to the the screenplay versus novel thing. Um, screenplays and novels do have certain things in common. Um, whereas though novels you have to fill in so much more. Um, you have to fill in all the settings, you have to fill in all the descriptions, you have to fill in all the action because you're not just watching it. So that's that's really where they differ and that's a whole different skill set than just writing the dialogue. Though I do agree that you can learn a lot about, about dialogue by listening to a screenplay. Screenplays are divided into three acts and you have to have each plot point on a certain end on a certain page when you're writing them. You have a little bit more fudge room with a novel, as long as they're ending kind of in you know, within this, these ten pages or so, those then then you're you're hitting your story arc. So um, you have a little bit more leeway with a novel. You can go to a four act kind of configuration with a novel that you can't really do with screenplay. So. With the dialogue, one problem that I have, especially with newer writers, is that, and I wish that they listened to TV or movies more to get over this, is that they, they don't use contractions. So the dialogue sounds stilted. 
very seldom do people talk, do not go there, you know. <laughs> and I'm constantly putting things into contractions. And the one thing I tell them is read your dialogue out loud. Record how does it sound to you? Yeah, how does it sound when you read it out loud or record it or, or have somebody read it out loud to you? How does it sound? Does it sound natural? Um, when, when they're doing a book in first person, then it's almost like the whole thing is dialogue without being dialogue because that person is narrating the story. And when they have two people switching back and forth, then it's so important that they have a different voice. And that's where the different patter has to come in. They have to have a different pace. They have to have a different sound to their narration because it's not just for a line or two here and there. It's for the whole chapter or chapters that they're talking and we're, that we're inside their head. And um, that's a little harder to get them to understand, especially at first. They'll, they'll get it eventually. But um, that takes a lot more work. Vocabulary for each character is different. It should never be the same. One character might uh, drop all the G's off of everything it says. A good place to go is to look up Patty Chayefsky. You can find some of his TV work. I can't recall the film, but it was uh, the famous scene was, I'm sick of this and I'm not going to take it anymore. Do you recall that? Oh, from uh, from Network. Network, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that yeah, where, yeah, where Peter Finch stands up and opens up the window and tells the people, yeah, yeah, Patty was fantastic. He yeah. New yeah, dialogue. Sterling knew... Sullivan from the Naked the City. Series. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know. I hear a lot of good dialogue in film today, but they're mostly independent films. There's some amazing independent films out there for dialogue and everything else. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't. I would hardly know if, what to tell a person how to differentiate from one character to another. Yeah, well, because we brought up pacing uh, with uh, when we were talking with Roz, and that is a tough. Thing because everybody has a pattern. If you listen to people, and uh, you know, there's a pattern. If you listen to like, uh, you know, a guy who's playing a a mob, a little short mob, you know, character who's you know annoying, and his pattern's fast, and he's always talking, and he's ready to do, and and then it's like a, it's almost like they're a little puppy, you know, jumping around, and you want to bring that to. You know, as an actor, it was easy. You get on stage and you do it. But you have to, you know, if you're going to do that as a character, you have to give that that sense of their patter, their sense. And you're right, it's hard. Cause, but if we learn, because the best thing is if you can take the pacing and make them grind against the antagonist and the protagonist, then it even adds to the scene when they're together, that there's this discourse yeah, they, they 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 can't. Yeah, there there's a discord of of sound that's not working. One has very uh, clipped. Uh, everything is perfect. They have the you know the harsh letters, and then the other person to make them a little more you know softer and have their words have more. Uh, vowels and stuff. It's it's a and you have to actually think as a writer. I, I think people forget that it is a craft and that you have to sit down and honestly design how your character is going to be. And uh, is that something you run into, Tony, where you have to explain to or you know, look at it and go, hmm, it would be nice if these characters or you know how far do you go as an editor in that realm? Well, unlike acting, we can't just sit there and and write faster so that they, <laughs> they talk faster, or we can't keep yeah. spelling things out so that they they sound a certain way because after a while that can get annoying if we have too many phonetic things. So we have to indicate it in different ways. Um, 
use things, more physical things, to slow a character down or um, speed them up uh, to get that initial. Well, you remember of, Morgan? Like remember Morgan's book? Morgan, um, when she had the different way this. Uh, Gentleman talked because he'd lived for a long time. He was a vampire. Yes, and he had yes, a certain yes. He was he was very, very precise. So we we do things like that rather than what an actor would do, because he can do things physically that we can hear and see. And in uh, writing, we have to indicate it in different ways. Um, so like Morgan did, one character did not use contractions at all in his speech because he was very precise. He was from a different... Um, another character might use nothing but contractions. Another character might use a lot of slang. Um, another character... You know, they, there's just lots of different things that we can do. They, they might use a lot of regional colloquialisms. Um, there's just a lot of things that we can do to indicate more about their their personal way they grew up or anything vocally. Well, I, know that, I know that I like books that have you know ethnicity being the difference between characters because there's some flavor of where they came from that I already knew that I could bring into knowledge of saying okay mm -hmm. this is a scene between people that really are culturally different and I already understand that so now what are they doing together in this particular moment manager against you know an employee trying to get them to do something or listen to them about a complaint or some sort of conflict you say but I know that they're two different kinds of people yeah. and they sound like two different kinds of people when I was a kid I read the James Harriet books all creatures great and small and all those and he wrote out phonetically a lot how they did the Yorkshire accent well I wrote something like that in class because I was in junior high at the time. Teacher marked me down terribly for it. I didn't understand why, because, you know, hey, this is a great English accent, right? <laughs> well, as I've read more, I can understand why, because it gets really annoying to try and decipher all that in print. And so when someone wants to do an accent in print, I encourage them to do a flavor of it, for example rather than to write it all out phonetically because it gets really annoying if you have to decipher every single word um, dropping part of a word here and there gives you a flavor rather than phonetically writing out every single word it just gets really you don't, you don't want to make your reader work yeah. you know, not in that way you, you can make them work to put the pieces of the story together to put the clues together, but you don't want to make them work to read the book. <laughs> is it okay? Is it okay to say things like, uh, as he said in his wonderfully lyrical Irish brogue? Is that okay to say, or you don't say it every time they talk? But well, to no, give you, a flavor. You, you you just you just say maybe the character who's listening could comment in their mind about how thick his brogue was or something, you know. But you don't have to actually phonetically write it all out. Go ahead, Harlan. There are uh, uh, little tidbits you can add at the end of a sentence, for example, to bring out what you know a person is English or Irish. And I'll use uh, cowboy as an example he'd make a statement and then end it with a question. Yeah, they have that nice little lilt yeah. in their voice. Isn't it? Yeah, well, he'd, he'd use a phrase, isn't it? And so that doesn't make much sense, does it? And you're about <laughs> to answer and he continues to speak. <laughs> you have to get used to that. I, I knew, uh, I had a, uh, a history teacher in high school who ended practically every statement he made with the phrase, don't you see? And there, there was no question mark at the end. He wasn't saying, don't you see? He'd say, don't you see? Without the question mark. 
and it was typical of him. And I remembered that all my life. I, I used it now in a character I've already written. There are things like that that you can use to imply an accent, uh, an English accent. Uh, time for a bit of tea, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say? See what I mean? You can have the little at the end of that. Or the, the famous what, what? Yeah, yeah. Ewa. And it doesn't really mean that you're, they're asking you what. It's just part of their... Oh, one of my favorites, though, is uh, Vicar at Dibley is a British series. And one of the characters would go, no, 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 no. Yes. Because <laughs> it had... Yeah, that was just... And his wife was, yes, 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 yes. No. <laughs> and it was you know, these were great character bits and you would go those are wonderful if you can bring some of that forward in your writing too because everybody has those little those little things they do um, writing is such an amazing art form and, uh, and we're using those little archaic symbols to put words together and then sentences and we're making such beautiful poetry out of this seemingly simple little thing and I appreciate anybody who can do it with wonder and I appreciate it when somebody's willing to learn too who says okay please how do I make my writing better and that's the ba that's what an editor can help with I you know it's that sense that um, an editor isn't there to destroy you. An editor is there to help make your word pictures paint the picture it should. And if it's not, you need someone to tell you that so that you can figure out, okay, how do I do that? And this person can help you to develop that writer's voice, your individual voice, which is very important. Um, we've come to that magical time where it's an hour, and uh, this is where I finally ask the guests to uh, give their final thoughts for today on the subject. So Tony, your final thoughts for today and uh, also your little commercial. Don't forget to let people know where they can find Tony Rakestraw on the net. Okay, well you can find me at rakestrawbookdesign.com. I am also on Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter as Tony Rakestraw. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Um, That's with an I, people, with an I. Yes, T-O-N-I. Um, editing is a very important part of the process, and I can't speak for all the editors out there, but I know that uh, for my clients, I'm on their side. I want their book to be the best it can be, and I want to help you get it there. Um, I don't destroy you. I will not try and tear you apart. I try to make my criticisms very constructive and help you get it, get your book to the point where it can be what you want it to be. Um, in fact, I like it best when my clients work with me and uh, don't just wait for me to do my thing and hand it back to them so they can do their thing. I like to be a collaborative effort. So um, anyway, that's how I work anyway. So I hope that this was a helpful hour. <laughs> I think there was a lot of good information. I think Jim and Harlan brought up some fabulous points. And, of course, the host was always fantastic. Uh, yeah. So. No, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jim, you are so good. At that. Uh, Jim, your final thoughts for today. Well, it's interesting because I'm an outsider to the process of writing other than, you know, technical stuff I do for, you know, something to do with computer pro code or programming or something detailed that is quite analytical. There isn't really any dialogue. It's presenting information so that others can consume it. But when you talk about the story, you're saying, I'm going to create not only the atmosphere and the action, but I'm going to develop characters that supposedly come off the page into someone's mind and they stay there for a long time because they remember that story as the reader saying, I'm not going to reread the book, but I'm not going to forget this either. I'll remember this two years from now. When is the next book coming out? So 
that's I think where the editor says do you want a series of ten books or seven or four or is it just something you want to just sort of do and then move on to something else you know what's the purpose so what I got from today is interesting in that an editor sits down and has a game plan that has been devised by the author and then tries to say how does that game plan get enacted get polished or should we change it and then my, my last little question that you know everyone can can do here is an editor supposed to just simply send back and forth like emails or a copy of the manuscript with margin notes or is, should there be a a conversation where you speak over the phone or in person saying let's talk about it rather than just exchanging a bunch of notes so that's that's my final thought for today yeah Tony do you want to talk of that Tony I do it many different ways um, I do edits in line with track changes on words so they see the edits there I put comments in the margins and if they want to talk on the phone I do that as well so um, it all depends on the individual author and how they want to handle it yeah it gives the author their opportunity some authors are more uh, uh, they're more comfortable with just texting, and others want to talk, and so we give them those opportunities. Yeah, you because everybody has their best and most, and they're comfortable with different styles. So Harlan, what do you have to say for your final? I would suggest that anyone who wants to write better dialogue begin to uh, read plays. Death of a Salesman is a good example. And in terms of differences in dialogue, uh, can't remember the name of the salesman, but his uh, son Biff and he have a conversation, and his his wife and he have conversations. And you mean are, Willie? Willie Loman, yeah, yeah. Willie Loman, yeah. Their their dialogues are are quite different. Um, Biff is a bit more calm. Willie is always anxious, or he develops an anxiety that's unbeatable <laughs> by the time the play is over. Uh, the Crucible is another one. It's, if you can get beyond the story, it's an incredible story. But the dialogue in that is really quite good because there seems to be a defense that has to be set up for these women who are being accused of being witches. And again, I I don't recall. I know his name, but I don't recall the author. Arthur Miller. Okay. Arthur Miller. Yeah. Anton Chekhov is another a Russian writer. His dialogue is terrific, and his plays are very good as well. Uh, Tolstoy. All the Russian writers produce really great dialogue. I would suggest if you want to improve your dialogue. Read writers who are notable for dialogue and to start reading plays. And I think you'll begin to get the knack of it with that. Very good. I agree. Uh, I learned a lot from writing acting. <laughs> that was surprisingly the development of the character, the development of your involvement within this storyline that's handed to you. And that taught me a lot about character development and developing my story. Uh, when we look at editing, editing is, uh, it's, you have to have somebody, a third eye, look at it. I know I've said this several times, I think it's worth telling people, you know, it's not many eyes all the time. I know people go, I sent it out to a lot of people, and they all went through it, and they all did it. Uh, but it's the right eyes. Send it to the right eyes. You need to send it to a real editor. You need to you know, have that editor look at it. The reason for that, and let's take somebody who has a lot of people who know him. He's written a lot of books, and that's uh, Guy Kawasaki, and he writes in his book, Ape, how you know he set this all up, had a bunch of people look at it. They all read it. They He and his partner who was writing the book, Sean, 
uh, they worked on it and worked on it, and they'd suddenly send it to an editor thinking that, okay, it's ready. The editor will find maybe a couple of mistakes. And the editor sent it back with 1,500 <laughs> errors. And that's because the right eyes looked at it. it. It's just that it's, you know, we start glossing over, we start reading it. As a, I'm a, you know, I, as a writer, you know, I do the same thing. My wife can read a book and go, oh, there are so many errors, and I'll go, really? <laughs> I just got into the dang story. <laughs> so I get lost. It's her job to see that. My job was just to enjoy the story. And uh, so some of it doesn't, but there are people who notice that stuff, and they're always the ones who write reviews. I don't know why it is. It's the ones who go off and say, well, I could have read this story, but the first paragraph had three errors, and I threw the book away. And you're going, wow. <laughs> so that's who you are got to watch out for, people. So get yourself an editor. Get thee to an editor. Can't say that more than one. Get yourself an editor. Now, if you're looking for one, they're all out there. There's a lot of people for price ranges and everything. Um, you know, Rake Straw Book Design, we help you with editing. We help you with your book cover. We even help you format the book ready for print. We're not a publisher, but we'll help you get the book ready to print or to be an ebook. So that's one of the major parts of doing this. And, you know, if you need someone to take a look and help you develop your story, we do that too. We can sit down, talk. One of the biggest things I do is, I'm a story guy. You want, you have a plot issue, I can sit down and help you figure out your plot issues. It's something I'm good at. I've always done it. I love it. Um, I love the uh, the ability to sit there and talk your characters. So, uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, Tony. That was fantastic. We, I appreciate all the wonder and beauty that you brought to this. Uh, thank you again, Harlan, and of course, Jim. I know you say you're not a writer, but you you talk a good you talk about it like you know about it. So good for you, you guys. Did a great job today. Uh, thank you, people. Um, we will have more in the next few weeks. We're going to talk a lot about writing. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, Joe. Uh, Oh, Joe Jackson. Yeah. Yep. Joe Jackson. Oh, that'll be good. Yeah. He's a great detective, great, great speaker because he really gets across a lot of information in one paragraph. It's really cool. He does. He's going to be talking us through his simple uh, business plan for writers, which might sound simple, but it is like the champagne of sh simple. I'm telling you, this guy has put together a fantastic. Uh, thing that will walk you through how to put together a business plan. And as a writer, if you want to sell your work, that's the next part of the whole gambit is knowing where you're going to do, how you're going to find, and uh, he, he's he got a great one. So we'll talk about that next week. Uh, the, then later that week, we're going to talk uh, with a lady about historical fiction. Um, she is a marvelous lady. She's written uh, some great stuff, and that's uh, Suzanne Adair. She's marvelous. She uh, she writes historical fictions that takes place in re the revolutionary time in the southern part of our country. Part that we forget that they were they were fighting the British even down there, and uh, so she's got some great and very strong female characters that aren't actually trying to be 20th century, 21st century women. She's trying to write them as their era, which is really amazing. She's a good writer. And then I'm going to talk to you about how I develop and build a story. Uh, so we got a lot coming up and we're going to have more. We're going to have uh, people back uh, like Lynn Bohart's going to be back to talk about Red Herring. I hope to get Patty and all the rest of those wonderful women I had on here before talking about you know outlining, talking about uh, you know LinkedIn, talking about how to do pacing for your story. There's going to be a myriad of stuff. We're all here, ready to work with you, and uh, have a great day. And uh, one Squishy. Quick, one quick question, John. Sure, sir. Okay. Next next Sunday is August the 4th, correct? Correct. Okay. You said Joe Jackalone is going to be on. Right. And then the ne the later in that week, but I'm going to have Suzanne. Is Marguerite going to be on with him? Uh, I don't know. She might. I don't know. It's up okay. to her. Okay, Marguerite. I have, I have offered. The, yeah, I have. Okay. I have offered it, but uh, you know, 
they show up if they want. Um, okay. So she's a great lady. Yes. Um, also, uh, Slush Heap. Uh, I'm not sure what they're doing at this moment, but I hope they'll be back on, uh, back up and running in a little bit. But it's a great bunch of shows. Go to slushheap.com. That's slushheap.com. Uh, Darcy and Rudy are fabulous people to talk to, and uh, they will have their shows coming up soon again. So, but they have a lot of good of those uh, shows in archives. So go see theirs, and don't forget to share. I always like it when you share me. Go down below and share. Uh, even Harlan likes to share, and I tell you right now, Harlan has some of the best. I mean, the man writes some of the best synopses on our shows. He does some really great stuff. So, uh, go to the uh, event page or go where you saw, you know, this show, and he'll have something to say about what we had to say today. He always finds something. Uh, and a lot of times, it's about Jim's hair. I'm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, John, no, Harlan is the synopsinator. I have to admit yeah, that. Yeah. 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 It's it sort of reminds me of watching the Dean Martin roast, is what it yeah. seems to me more like. Yeah. yeah. And so have a great week, people. We will see you later, and thank you so much. This is Rake Straw Book Design, and uh, we'll see you next time. And remember to feed the soul of a writer. Read their books and blogs. Have a great day.